When the Buddha talks about gratitude, he does so in the context of the teaching on karma and rebirth. And it's worth thinking about what the implications of that are. When he's talking about mundane review, that there are good and bad actions and that these actions have results, both in this lifetime and on into the next. He mentions an interesting phrase, there is mother and father, which seems almost too obvious to say. We all have mothers and fathers. But what it meant in the context of the time was that you owe a debt of gratitude to them. And it's because of the nature of karma that you do. There were people who taught that whatever people do is totally influenced or totally determined by, say, the stars or some creator god or their past karma. In other words, people don't have choices. So when your parents had you, they had no choice in the matter. When they raised you, they had no choice in the matter. It was just what they had to do. And so there's no special debt of gratitude there. It's just the influences from the stars or influences from whatever else acting through them. But the Buddha's teaching on karma has several features that make gratitude an appropriate response. One is that we have freedom of choice. Our actions are real. And they come from our intentions, and we have the choice of what kind of intentions we're going to act on. So when someone does something good to you, it does have a meaning. It was a choice. And if they have to go out of the way, if they have to make sacrifices, it's worth your gratitude. In fact, the word for gratitude in Pali, katanyu contains the root. I mean, kata comes from the verb to do. You literally know and appreciate what has been done. This is why gratitude is different from general appreciation. We can appreciate the trees, we can appreciate the, the weather right now, it's making it easy to practice. But there's no one doing that. Or if you want to argue for a Creator God doing that, you can say, well, why, did, why is it more difficult for a God to do things pleasantly than unpleasantly? But in the Buddhist teachings, those are just the way things are in terms of the way weather works or the way plants work. They have no decision in the matter. It's when people make the decision to go out of the way to do something good. That requires a special response on your part, both for the person who is good to you. You want to repay that goodness. And also for your own realization that other people may benefit from your going out of your way for them. Otherwise you want to spread the goodness around. This kind of reflection opens your heart, widens your heart, makes you more likely to want to go out of your way. There's a sentence. I'm not sure whether it's Thai or it's in the Pali Canon, that gratitude is a sign of a good person. And it's just for this reason. If someone appreciates the goodness that other people have done and the amount that they had to go out of their way to deal with all kinds of difficulties, that makes it more likely that they themselves will be willing to go out of their way to be helpful, to be good. There was a case years back where the family lived down in front of the monastery. Had a big ruckus one night. The son from the father's previous marriage came back. He was an adult now. Got into a huge argument with the father, kicked him downstairs, broke both of his legs. And when the news came to the monastery, John Fung's first comment was, you can never trust that son. In other words, if he's willing to do this to his father, he could do this to anybody. So gratitude is a sign of a good person, and it is an attitude that gives rise to more goodness within us. In particular, the Buddha talks about the, the debt we have to our parents. Because after all, we are alive, we have a body because of them. And even, even if they weren't the best parents, at least we have this human lifetime, this particular body right now. 
something in particular deserving a feeling of gratitude. Now the Buddha said the best way to repay that is if they are stingy people, you try to teach them how to be generous. If they're not virtuous, you try to teach them to be virtuous. In other words, whatever goodness they are lacking, you try to influence them in that direction. Now you know, of course, how hard it is to teach your parents. You have to be really subtle and really wise in how you do that. But it is possible. I've seen cases. I reflect further on the, the Buddhist teaching on parents. There's that statement that you will never meet or be very hard to meet someone who hasn't been your mother or father in the past. Now, Some people take that and say well, that means that you should feel affection for everybody because they've been your parents at some point or another. But the Buddha takes it in a different direction. He says it should give rise to a sense of dismay. All these times you've been parents, and all the times you've had the, all these parents you've had, and all the times you've been a parent to somebody else. It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth like this. And we know what it's like between children and parents. This also fits into the teaching on karma. There's basically clear karma, and then there's dark karma. Clear karma, of course, is good karma done with good intentions, dark karma done with bad intentions, mixed. And then there's the karma that leads away from karma, leads to an end of karma. And you look at the karma we have with everybody around us we've had for who knows how long, and it's going to be a real mixture of clear and dark, in which your parents weren't satisfactory. And then you've been a parent sometimes, and of course what you did was not satisfactory to your children. And so the karma goes back and forth between clear and dark, clear and dark, and it never gets anywhere unless you decide to get out. So that's another good reflection. One of the best things you can do for the whole mass of people who, all these people who have been your parents and all the people you've been parents of in the past, is to get out of the system. And that's what we're doing as we meditate. This is why the reflection on gratitude is one useful way of getting the mind to be willing to settle down in the present moment, realizing that this is the way out. As the Buddha said, this karma leads to the end of karma and all the entanglements that come with karma. So he listed it just now in, the, in his first sermon, the, the Eightfold Path. Everything from right view on to right concentration, that's the karma that leads to the end of karma. So as a working on concentration, in other words, Basically, right now it's right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration all together. At least that's what we're trying to develop. That's part of this karma that's going to get us out of this tangle and give the best possible way of repaying the people that we've been so intimately connected with before. We can dedicate the goodness to them, and if they appreciate it, they, they will benefit. So you take your mind around the world, you take your mind around the huge span of time, and then you zero in on the present moment, because the present moment is the way out. This is the same pattern that the Buddha followed on the night of his awakening. First knowledge was about time, how far it goes back, and all the narratives of his life. You think you have narratives when you come to sit down here, and the Buddha had thousands and thousands of them. But having so many, they, they got reduced to the bare essentials. This is, this is what he looked like, this is what his name was, or what he was called. This is experience of pleasure and pain, this is what he ate, and this is how he died. That's life. Five sentences. And one after another after another. But instead of getting tied up in the narratives, the next question is, well, does everybody else follow this pattern too? And the second knowledge of the night is awareness spread to fill the entire universe. He realized that everybody goes through this process. And in seeing the fact that everybody went through the process, he also saw what drove it. And basically it was intentions. And the intentions were skillful or unskillful, depending on whether they're based on 
right view or wrong view. So the third question was, what kind of intentions might lead out? That's when, again, the knowledge led to his awakening. So sometimes as you sit down to meditate, it's good to think about vast expanses of time, vast expanses of the universe, to see the common patterns, and then realize that the common patterns are generated here in your mind, here in the present moment, which is why we're working right here. And working on your mind right here, working on your intentions, trying to get some control over your intentions is a gift to yourself and to the people around you. This is one of the good things about when the Buddha talks about merit. It's basically instructions on how to find happiness in your engagement with the world in a way that doesn't cause any suffering, doesn't cause any harm to anybody. In other words, your happiness spreads around. And meditation is one of those activities where the happiness, where the goodness spreads around. You see this most clearly if you've been meditating and the mind was filled with anger before you sat down to meditate, but by the time you're done the anger has subsided. That means you've saved the people around you from the anger that you might have expressed in your words or your deeds. And the more time you give to the meditation, the more you train the mind, the more you deep the results become, and the more deep the impact they have on other people. So all this contemplation comes under what the Buddha calls generating desire. It's part of right effort, generating this desire to do something skillful, to understand what action is and your power of choice, and that you're going to try to use that power well. You're not like the congressman in that New Yorker cartoon where they're coming down the steps of the Capitol and one of them is saying, is, what use is power if you can't abuse it? You've got a power here. If, if you abuse it, you're going to be the one who's abused. So you want to use this power of choice and you want to use it well. And you can. The Buddha is showing you how. The instructions are not superhuman. As he said, if they were superhuman, he wouldn't have taught them. So when the mind feels tempted to go out someplace else, remind yourself that what you're doing right here, being with the breath, even though you may not be seeing all the results you want right away, at least it's headed in the right direction. We don't just sit in the present moment. The present moment has an arrow. It moves into the future. Time has an arrow. So what you do now will have an impact now and on into the future. So sometimes the immediate impact is not what you want, or not as good as you want, but it's headed in the right direction. It's part of a path. The path that leads to knowledge, the path that leads to awakening. A path that leads to goodness all around. So when you're tempted to slip off the path, remind yourself, it's hard to find a path that's good. And whatever else you're slipping off to is pretty miserable in comparison. And it's in this way that reflection on gratitude in the context of karma can bring you right here. Doing what you should be doing in terms of the duties of the Four Noble Truths. Duties that are not imposed on you. but. And you realize you want to put it into suffering, you want to put it into karma, this is how it's done. And here's your opportunity to do it. So let that thought be uplifting.